This is episode 72, the Sports Business Classroom Audio Experience. Welcome to the Sports Business Classroom Audio Experience. I'm your host, Sergio Millis, and each week I'll bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover how to break in and succeed in sports and life. Thanks for spending some time with me today, and let the experience begin. Today's guest is the one and only Garrett White of Vayner Sports. Garrett is a rising superstar in the business of sports who currently works in operations and partnerships at Vayner Sports, a full service talent representation and brand consulting agency that is doing some incredibly interesting things in the business of sports. Ladies and gentlemen, you do not want to miss this episode, as it is one of the best and most instructive conversations I have had on the podcast to date. In this episode, you will hear advice on how to get in front and stay in front of high level people how to get your foot in the door and figure out how to add value to an organization, the skills, habits, and mindset that have gotten him to where he's at today, and what he's learned working for A.J. Vaynerchuk. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't overstate how excited I am for you to listen to this episode. If you listen carefully and really digest what Garrett has to say, I have no doubt that you will have learned a lot and will walk away with actionable advice on how to become a better human being and professional. Without further ado, I give you Garrett White. All right. Well, Garrett, welcome to Sports Business Classroom. It's great to have you on. Uh, We've known each other for about six months now. And one of the things that stood out to me when we had that first conversation is that even though, you know, your your career is still so young, like I felt like, like we vibed, like we connected instantly when we talked and that we're on the same page about so many different things. And really excited to, to dive in here today because you have, you have so much to share from an experience, experience standpoint, like at su- such a young age. And there's no doubt in my mind that if you aren't a superstar already in the business, that you are going to be a superstar in this business. And it's just great to have you. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate the, uh, <clears throat> you know, appreciate the kind intro, Serge. And I definitely feel the same. I feel like, uh, you know, we connected early. Um, I'm humbled to be on this. I, I was, uh, I was a little bit surprised when you asked me to be on, but I'm excited, excited to jam. feel like we always have great chats and, um, excited to bring it to, uh, to the audience today. Yeah, absolutely. So you're doing, you're doing a lot of fun stuff at Vayner sports right now, and we're going to get into all that. But, uh, before we do, why don't we get into a little bit about your background? Like tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what, uh, your childhood was like and, and all that fun stuff. Sure. Yeah. So grew up in Southern California. Um, Surf City, USA was, was right next door, Heinz Beach, California. I grew up in Newport. Um, you know, grew up in a football family. My dad was a, a high school football coach for um, 40 years. He was the head coach for over 30 years at Edison High School in Heinz Beach and had two older brothers that were eight and 11 years older than me. So um, that was a huge part of my childhood was kind of looking up to them and, and seeing all the cool things they were doing. They were both um, really phenomenal athletes. And my oldest brother played at, at Sacramento state and played college football. And, and my middle brother, uh, Hunter played at Boise state. And, um, you know, so, and, and that was when Boise state was in their, their golden era when they were top 10, top five. So, you know, grew up going to those bowl games and, and seeing them beat TCU in the Fiesta bowl and, and just being around college football and, and being around, you know, my dad and his football team. And, and so that was a huge part of my experience. You know, football was always a, a key piece and, and sports in general. You know, I would, in the summer when we would get out from school, I would, I would have like, you know, basketball practice nine to 12 soccer practice, you know, one to four and, and, you know, flag football five to seven. And so, um, that was a huge piece. And then, you know, my mom was also a, a really, um, you know, influential figure in my life and, and she was a hairdresser. She, um, you know, really a self-made that's woman. Where you have the, uh, that's she, where you have the great hair. <laughs> yeah. She, she would always get on me early on. You know, she was like, you can't walk out of the house with that bed head. It's a reflection on me and my professional <laughs> career. I'm like, that has nothing to do with you. But, um, but no, yeah, she was a, she was a huge piece and, and, and just kind of looking up to her and seeing her work ethic, you know, and she, um, she was able to, to have a really successful career and, um, and just someone that I admired for, for just being so tenacious and, and really instilling that work ethic in me. And she was kind of, you know, my dad would definitely push me in, in the sports and, and he valued school, but she really was the driver in school for me. So, 
Um, I didn't really get any slack on either side, you know, so they kind of, they kind of tag team that, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, you know, the high level. Yeah. I, I read an article about you in the LA times that said that your mom read to you 30 minutes a day, basically your whole childhood, which yeah. I think is awesome. Like it's something that I do with my girls as well. And as much as, you know, it takes a lot of time to do that. Right. It obviously no results in, you know, um, good things for you, both academically and, you know, as we'll get into here from a, uh, from an athletic standpoint. So what, yeah, what sports I mean, that, did you play in high school? I played, um, basketball, volleyball, and football. Those were the three okay. I settled on. Um, but yeah, I mean, and it wasn't like something I liked to do was, you know, read every night. It was something that it was like, you know, we have to do this. And of course I have some fond memories about it, but like, there was a lot of discipline in that. And I would, I would drive around in the car with her and she would play classical music only, like no rap, no pop 40. Like she was, she, you know, she, she definitely was a driver in that regard, but I'm, I'm appreciative of it now. And sometimes at the time it's a little frustrating. Oh, no question. I'm sure my daughter hates it when I make her sit yeah. down and read with me for 30 minutes, but at the yeah. same time, you know, one day maybe uh, she'll end up at an Ivy league school like you did. Yeah. I mean, it definitely so a, gave me a, definitely gave me an advantage, gave me a leg up for sure. Yeah. So talk, talk to me a little bit about your, your, your dad, right? So you said your mom was the academics, you know, I know yep. your dad was a high school football coach, right? That's, that's very interesting to have a mom that's academics, classical mm -hmm. music. What was your relationship with your dad? Cause I know your dad is a, uh, an influential yeah. coach. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, his impact on our community is really undeniable. You know, I, I, there was a list that came out. It was a pretty surreal moment. It was like top 100 most influential people in Newport Beach. And, you know, Kobe Bryant's number eight and, the, you know, the, the mayor of the city. And my dad's on that list. And I was, I, that was really a moment. Where I was like, oh, sh like, wow. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you notice that you go out to lunch with them. I can't get through a lunch at, you know, a local pizza shop without three people coming up. Oh, coach, how's the team? Or, you know, you, you had such an impact on my son. And so, you know, um, I had a great relationship with him, but it's definitely one of those things growing up. I felt like I was sharing him, you know, he was, he was my dad, but he was also kind of this community figurehead and, and, um, you know, a father figure to, you know, 80 to a hundred, you know, young men every year on the, on the football team. And so, um, you know, that it was just an interesting dynamic. And, and uh, you know, I'm appreciative of it because because you look back and, and you see the impact that he had and something I didn't really understand when I was younger, but can really come to appreciate today. Like just what a um, what an impact he had on the community. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Right. Because he's dad. Right. And, yep. you know, him, and, you know, now you're seeing the impact that he's had on so many different people. That's, you know, between your mom's career and his career that's motivating, right? That's going to no, be that, very, very motivating. Yeah. And I think I kind of always looked at it. Um, you know, I wanted to create my own path. I, I was, um, I was impressed with both my parents. I thought they were, you know, disciplined and successful, but you know, I also wanted to kind of carve my own lane. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's kind of part of it too, is you're, you're inspired by them, but you also kind of want to do your own thing as well. So when did you figure that out? When did you start to have that feeling like, okay, my mom, super successful, my dad, super, super successful. You yeah. know, I want to do my thing. I mean, and your brothers, yeah. right. Your brothers played college football, you know, yeah. so it's easy for, you know, for the people listening, right. Like a lot of people kind of get stuck in that, right. They see the people that they live with. They're like, okay, I'm going to follow in dad's footsteps, but I know mm -hmm. that that may not be exactly what's right for me. Like what, yeah. Do you know at what point you you started having those types of thoughts? Um, yeah, you know, it's probably, it's probably when I was in like eighth grade or ninth grade, um, there was actually a point in, and after my freshman year, I played tackle football for the first time freshman year. So I played okay. flag from fifth to eighth grade, um, and had some really good ball skills, you know, really good route running skills, played with the older kids. Um, but my dad, he didn't really encourage me or even like kind of discouraged me to play tackle. He had just seen so many kids grow up playing tackle for 12 years before they even get to high school and get burned out on it. You know, the injuries, yeah. the concussions were starting to become a thing. And so my first year of tackle was freshman year of high school. And, um, honestly, I, you know, all that, you know, catching and route running was fun, but the hitting I didn't like. And I was kind of like, man, I'm not sure this is for me. You know, I'm, I'm, my body hurts and all the kids are trying to tee off on me because I'm, you know, coach's <laughs> son. And, 
Right. And, uh, so I think, you know, a big moment was I actually quit football for about a month, um, in the, the spring of my freshman year of high school. And I think, um, you know, that was kind of a moment where I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this my way. Um, and, and I have to go my own route. Um, I eventually ended up, um, and I, and I love basketball and volleyball so much at the time. And I had played on the JV team, you know, I played the whole AAU circuit growing up, was a really good basketball player, played on the JV team as a freshman, practiced with the varsity in volleyball as a freshman. So, um, that, that's kind of where I thought my lane was. And then I sat around kind of watching all the football guys, you know, for about a month. And I said, no, nah, I'm actually going to go back there. But even when I went back to football, it was on my terms, you know, and I told my dad, I don't want to play defense. I don't really like hitting. I want to be a receiver. I want to be a great receiver, but it was, you know, it was kind of my decision to come back. And I wasn't just following the family anymore. It felt like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this my way. And, and I think that's where I kind of started to carve my own niche. And then, I think it just kept growing from there. Yeah. And so I know you played, you played high school, high school football, and then you ended up at Yale, yep. right? How, t- talk a little bit about that, about your transition and going to college and playing football there and what led you yeah. to go there. Yeah. I mean, I had a lot of success in high school. Um, you know, all of these are, are stats in the yearbook, but you know, MVP, the sunset league. And you know, I was a, a preseason, you know, top, 15 player in orange County and kind of came in with pretty high expectations coming into Yale. Um, I didn't think down on the Ivy league, but I thought I could have played at a higher level. Um, and I I really made the decision for academics. And so I didn't expect the level of play to be what it was when I got, um, to Yale. And honestly, it's division one football. You're going up and practice against guys that are four years older than you that have gone through that grown man strength that have, you know, had, three off seasons and a college football strength program. And right. it was a rude awakening, you know? Um, and I, and I had been injured my senior year at the end of the year and I was still kind of had a, a lingering knee injury. And, um, I just mentally and physically wasn't prepared for that jump, you know? And it was, it was, um, it was a huge adjustment. I, you know, I went from West coast to all the way on the other side of the country. Um, school was no, was no joke, you know? And, and, and so, um, and I think that was such a, a time of growth for me because it was the first time really athletically I had faced real adversity. You know, it was the first time I hadn't been the star player. The first time I had to sit on the bench, first time I had to do scout team. And right. you learn a lot through those, you know, through those experiences, it's a humbling experience for you. And you realize, Oh, I'm really good, but there's a lot of other people that are just as good or better, you know? And so, so that was, a, I think a really um, important kind of transition moment and, and growth for me. No question. I mean, I remember kind of going through the same thing when I went to school at USC, right? I thought I was the man because I was yeah. the only kid that I know going to USC. And then you're at, you're there and it's like, okay, I'm one of 18,000 people going here, right? What's yeah. going to make me different, right? And, right? and you see, like, that's what I tell people, like that when they ask me, like, what'd you learn or what'd you get out of going out of U- at USC? I told them I, I, I learned what the expectations and the standards were for people who want to win. Right. Yep. And that was one of the biggest thing. And that, you know, I, I liked what you said about Yale, the grown men, right. Everybody around you is really smart and they're very athletic. And now you're just a guy basically starting all over, right. Trying to yeah, figure out how, I mean, you, how, to, you, how to make your mark. You think about it, right. It, you know, all the things that you were, you know, great athlete, great, you know, great uh, student, you know, all of the people around you were that same thing, you know, and, mm-hmm. and now you got to try to separate yourself from a new pack um, that all of those people in that pack have already separated themselves once, you know, and I think that's, that's every level, whether you go up in business, whether you go up, you know, between high school and college and, you know, some of the guys I work with the transition to the pros um, you have to re-separate yourself. And it's, it's a new level of people that have already done that from the level that you're coming from. So talk a little bit about that, how you did that at Yale, again, being around a bunch of studs and now you're, you're kind of looking around and you're thinking, man, I got to grow, right? I'm no longer the man here. And if I'm going to be the man, I'm going to have to grow into somebody that I'm not currently, you know, talk a little bit about how, how you did that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, you know, my career over Yale, I I never had um, crazy individual success and, you know, I, I figured out pretty early on. I wasn't going to be the most athletic guy on the team. You know, uh, Mm -hmm. there was guys that were, that God gave them more talents than me and they were going to be faster, stronger, jump higher, no matter how hard I worked. But you know, what I thought about was my, my differentiator, my whole life, um, 
you know, whether it was in school, I was never that, you know, super genius. Everything came, you know, easy to me or, you know, basketball. I didn't have, you know, crazy athleticism, but, you know, I, I, you know, I worked on the, the fundamentals and I, you know, had the great dribble, had a great jump, great, you know, defense. And so I just kind of realized like for me to separate myself, it's not going to be athletic. It's going to have to be with just, with just the work that I do every day. And, you know, I feel like over my four years, you know, I, I set an example in the weight room. Um, I was named, you know, an off season captain going into my, my senior year because of my leadership. And so, you know, you kind of figure out like, Hey, if I, I might not be, you know, the best player on the team anymore, that might not be an option. Um, you know, I got to do it with my attitude and my effort. Cause those are really the only two things I can control right now. And, um, you know, I try my best to do that every day. I try to be the best teammate I could be. And, um, you know, the team, which, you know, I had to really shift my mindset from, I want to have this many catches, this many yards, this many touchdowns to, um, I, I just want our team to have success. And however I fit into that equation, um, is really what success for me is going to look like over the course of my career. And, you know, the team won two championships while I was there, beat Harvard three times, which are big rivals. So, you know, the one game a year you sit in front of, you know, 30 to 60,000 people, depending on which school it is at. And, and prior to our class arriving, you know, the class that I graduated with, uh, Yale had not beaten Harvard in 10 years. We had not won an Ivy league title in, in, in 10 years. And so those were, those were huge accomplishments for, for the group of guys that I was a part of. And, um, you know, I just, I, it was, that's how I had to redefine success for myself. Right. And I think that's amazing. Right. I, like what I took from that is, you know, you got to figure out where it is you fit in based on what yep. your strengths are. Right. Yeah. And that's the, that's the key for everybody listening. You know, um, we all have a perception of where it is, you know, who it is we are and how we can contribute. Right. But the proof's in the pudding, you know, and it's worth, you know, self-reflection. Right. One of the themes I've heard so far is that you've done that quite a bit throughout your young career, your, your life yeah. and your career where it's like, you know, just even taking the time to take a step back and see where it is you are and where you can contribute and how you can grow. Like that's such a valuable skill that so many people don't necessarily do. Right. No doubt. So I, I, th yeah, I think, no, that I, that's I, I think uh, self, self-awareness, self-reflection is, is such a differentiator, right? Cause if you don't understand your strengths and your weaknesses, you could never uh, double down on the things that you're really good at and, and you can right. never work to improve the things that you're not so good at. And I think so many people are scared of saying, I'm not good at this. Right. Right. Um, and, and that's okay. Like no one's good at everything. Right. And, and on the flip side, so many people are scared of saying I'm, I'm world-class in this, right. I'm one of the best in this, right. you know, skill set, or right. And, and there's, there's merit to that saying I'm freaking really good at this thing and I know it, I'm going to be confident about it and I'm going to improve it and work to hone it. And so I think, you know, if you don't have that self-awareness piece um, it's really hard to improve. Yeah. No question. No question. So we'll get into a little bit later. We're going to get into like whether or not you have any processes that, you know, to, to, to gain that self-awareness and kind of what yep. you might do. But let's talk at what point did you decide? I mean, you figured out early on that, you know, football wasn't going to be, you weren't going to the NFL, right? Yep. You figured that out pretty early on. Yep. At what point did you decide that you wanted to, to work in sports? I, um, I had a meeting with my, my coach ended up being my coach. Wasn't the coach at the time, the head coach at Yale, Tony Reno came to my high school, um, to recruit me, uh, my senior year. And during that recruiting process, or actually it might've been before the senior anyways, around that timeline where I was deciding to go to Yale, you know, spring of my junior year of high school, all these coaches started to come out and, and, you know, one of the things they want to know is, uh, especially at a school like Yale, you know, what do you want to do after football? You know, and, and they don't say that you're not going to go to the NFL. We've had guys go to the NFL, but, you know, for everyone that comes through there, one day football is going to be over and, and they want to know what you want to do after football so they could, you know, put you in touch with the right, you know, alumni for internships so they could, you know, connect you with the right people in the industries that you want to be in. And so that was really the first time I had to sit down and think about that question. And, right. um, I was, I had no, I had nowhere to start. I really had, I really hadn't thought about anything other than being a great athlete and a great student up until that point. And so, um, I had to sit in again, a, a time for self-reflection and what, in 
it's such a heavy question. What do I want to do for the rest of my life after football? It's like, right. I'm 18 years old. How, how do, how am I supposed to know? Yeah, you're and like, what I, am I talking? What are you talking about? I'm going to be in the, right. I'm going to be a, you know, all pro in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah. Or not, or not even that. Just like when I'm 26, I, I don't even know what my life is going to look like. You know, like sure. how am I supposed to know what I want to do till I'm 50 or 60? Like that's, it's just such a daunting, you know, big decision to make at that young of an age. And, and um, what I later came to learn is like, you could change your mind a million times. I could still change my mind today. But in that moment, I, I really felt like it was like, all right, one answer. And then the papers signed in, you're done. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, attracted me to the, what I eventually answered to coach Reno is I want to be a sports agent. And, and I think, you know, where that came from was I knew I wanted to stay involved in sports um, you know, all the things around sports that are not the actual game have always been the most attractive to me, the, the teamwork needed for success, the, you know, the adversity you deal with on a regular basis, um, you know, just really just people, right? The people in sports are forced to work together. And, and, I, and I wanted to stay very close to that. Um, but I didn't, I knew, I also knew that I didn't want to be a coach like my dad, um, that I didn't really want to be um, anything other I wanted to be a businessman. And so I I kind of narrowed it down from there. I wanted to be in business um, and I I wanted to work in sports. And and there was really a few options at that point. And and sports agents sounded cool and fun and exciting. And so that's what I said. So talk about uh, how you actually got your job at Vayner Sports. How did that all come about? Yeah, I mean, that was that was a process starting within probably an internship that I got uh, after my freshman year at Yale. So I did an internship with uh, a company called Sports One Marketing. Uh, Dave Meltzer is the CEO over there. He's a, a very successful entrepreneur. Um, and that was kind of my first touch point into what working in the business sports was, was like, you know, and, and seeing the marketing deals that they did, seeing, you know, going to the SBs, um, seeing what those kind of activations look like. It was, it was a, a really um, exciting and, and, and kind of glamorous, you know, glimpse into the world of sports. Um, and so, you know, you know, from there, I just, I kind of started, I remember one of the first most important things that they did was they made me set up a LinkedIn account. I had no idea what a LinkedIn was. You know, it was, it was like, I felt like uh, one of those 50 year olds trying to start a Twitter account, right? I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is this LinkedIn thing? And so, um, <laughs> so I got on LinkedIn and then I kind of started to see like, oh, this person has a thousand connections on LinkedIn. Like, man, like think about that and look at the people they're connected to. And I, I started the kind of a, 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 a switch flip for me that networking was going to be an important piece. And, and coming off that summer, I started to really double down and, and I would do this thing, especially in the off season after my sophomore year. Um, you know, I would just reach out to a bunch of people on LinkedIn. Hey, you're a lawyer that works in sports. I'd love to talk to you. Hey, you're a sports agent. I'd love to talk to you. Hey, you work in marketing. And I just had calls all the time. And, and a lot of these people were taken aback. They're like, man, you're how you're a sophomore in college. You know, I usually get calls from seniors that are just graduated or juniors that are looking for an internship. But uh, a lot of them were really impressed that I was reaching out so early and starting that process. And so it honestly, it eliminated a lot of friction. They were excited to get on the phone with me. They, they were, you know, impressed that I was doing that outreach that early. And so I just, I just started to have a lot of calls. Um, and what I learned through that was I just got to see a ton of different, I had so much data coming in right? This is yep. what the lawyer in San Francisco that works in sports feels about his job. And this is what this guy in Dallas feels about his job. And it was just, it just kind of started to you know map out really easily for me to see um, right. the things that I wanted to kind of do. And uh, I, I kind of had another experience after that, where I started to go deeper down the sports agency route. And, you know, I won't go into too much detail, but I really kind of got turned off from the, from the industry. Um, and I really kind of said, ah, I'm not sure this is what I want to do, you know? And, and every time you talk to a sports agent still today, if, if, if someone called me, the first thing they say, if you say, I want to be a sports agent is don't, right. I <laughs> don't be a sports agent. I, have, yeah. I had the same thing happen to me. Yeah. And so I had so many of those calls where I was like, Hey, I want to, I, I want to be a sports agent. And they said, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. Bad industry, tough business, super competitive. Don't do it. And uh, I just kind of got discouraged. I was like, well, if all these people are going to tell me not to do it, and these are some of the more successful people in the industry, why, like, who am I to think that I could do this? You know? And so right. um, I kind of backed away a little bit. I, I worked a commercial real estate internship going into my senior year. And um, I was sitting at a desk doing, looking at rent rolls, looking at, um, you know, commercial real estate properties. 
And I was thinking back on that internship going into sophomore year. And I was like, man, this is not even close to the, as much fun. You know, I just, I, I didn't have that same passion. I didn't wake up every day excited to go to work. Um, and I thought, you know, I really got to give it another shot. And, and, and I think that was a moment that was, uh, you know, I want to, uh, I know your audience, you know, a lot of people that are looking to get into the industry. And that was a moment where I had to kind of say, okay, just because people say it can't be done, just because it's really hard to do, just because everyone tells me I shouldn't, that doesn't mean I, I shouldn't listen to myself. You know, that doesn't sh- mean I shouldn't bet on myself. And, and it was that self-awareness that I, I felt I had the skill set to be successful in the industry. Um, and then it was a matter of figuring out what the right spot was for me at that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how'd you get in touch with AJ? Yeah. And so, Sports? Yeah. I mean, from there, I kind of, I kind of had seen the whole landscape, right? And, and I, I knew about um, Gary, uh, AJ's brother and, and our chairman at Vayner Sports. Uh, you know, Gary V on, on Instagram, I think every... 17, 18, 19 year old at the time when I was that age was, was watching his content and, Mm -hmm. or, or, or a lot of them at least. And and I was really captivated by it. You know, I thought a lot of the concepts that we, we talked about already, and and I'm sure more that we will talk about, you know, he was preaching to, um, to me via the phone. Uh, and it was kind of the first time I heard that, wait, this is a really successful businessman talking about self-awareness and gratitude, kindness. Right. Right. And it took it, you know, it, it really, it resonated with me. And I, and I, I conceptually understood a lot of the concepts that he was talking about and he made it in a way that like, this is a formula for winning. You know, when I listened to his content, I didn't think this was some sort of altruistic guy. I'm not saying Gary's not that, but I, I thought, wow, this is a shark and he's given us the playbook for everyone to see. And, and so I really, I'd really been captivated by his content. Um, I really thought he was cutting edge, you know, ahead of his time. He obviously early on tech dominated social media. Um, you know, now he's in web three. And so when I heard that he had started a sports agency, when I heard that his, his, his younger brother, AJ was the CEO of the sports agency, I thought, okay, this is, this is a spot I need to look into. Mm-hmm. And, you know, from there, um, really just the network thing that I had done up to that point, you know, I was able to get in touch with the head of marketing at Vayner sports. I was help, able to get in touch with the you know director of client services for the football department. And, you know, just cause you get in touch, you know, I took a meeting and they said, great, you know, thanks. Now we have your number, you know? And so you just kind of, for, for me, I just had to hang around, you know, and, and constantly hit them up, constantly stay in touch. Um, and, and, you know, not just be a one-off kid. Cause there's a lot of those people that, you know, come in take a meeting, take a phone call, and you never hear from them again, or they follow up, you know, a year later. And so I was just kind of a pest to those guys and, you know, credit to them. They gave me a lot of their time, you know, and, and, and I was able to, you know, to demonstrate that I was worthy of an introduction to AJ. Um, and I was able to bring some value uh, to them and, and, you know, to help them see that I was, I could be a valuable addition to the team. And then I got introduced to AJ via them um, about the spring of my senior year. So right as I'm about to graduate, I meet AJ in New Rochelle, which is a week later declared the the uh, the hot spot for the pandemic. The National Guard rolls into New Rochelle a week wow. after AJ and I have have breakfast <laughs> there, um, which was crazy. And so, yeah, so I met AJ, you know, spring of my senior year, right before COVID breaks out. And then, you know, there's this national pandemic. Everyone's leaving the office. No one's doing in-person meetings. And I really had to kind of stay on him. And, you know, I set up a monthly call you know, credit to him for giving me that time. He's, you know, super important, you know, successful businessman. He gave me 15 minutes every month. And, and I just took every single second of that 15 minutes to, you know, ask intelligent questions, demonstrate my curiosity. Um, and, and again, try to provide value, you know, Hey, is this interesting to you? If I could do this, would that help you? And, and, you know, not ask him what he could do for me, but see what I could do for him. And, And over the course of a year of those calls, um, I think he started to, to see that I was a guy that could, you know, could bring some value to what they were building. And so, you know, he had an opportunity to become his assistant. That was one thing that I never thought I would do. You know, I'd seen assistants in the industry. I said, I'm never going to be an assistant. But when I, when he offered me that position, I was like, that's my chance to get in the door. I don't know if he's going to offer another position. It's, you know, opportunity to be so close to him. And so, um, you know, I took it and, and that's where we got started. And you know what, Garrett, that's absolute gold. The fact that you you look you you took your relationship with AJ and just started thinking about how you could provide value, 
right? I think so many people today, I mean, I get hundreds of resumes, if not thousands a year, right? Wanting to work for us, wanting to earn, intern for the NBA Summer League, be attached to any of our properties, right? Yep. And what they're missing is how I can make your job easier, right? Like if you can get me on the phone or you can email me and spark my interest about how you can make my life or any of our lives uh, easier, I'm yep. interested, right? Right. But they, I'm totally interested, right? Right. But if it's about, hey, I'm graduating and I need a job, can we talk? It's like, dude, you're approaching this the wrong way. You right. provide value first, right? You show what you're capable of first. And then as you did, you become the, 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 the person that's there at the right time. And mm -hmm. time and time again, with young people that I mentor and people I've seen come up through the industry, like that's how they get their start, right? They did what you did. They connect with people, they provide value, and then eventually a door opens, right? Yep. And if you're the right person at the right time, that's that's where you know that's that's where you find your opportunities. No doubt. And I think the piece that you touched on is is really just about having empathy for the person that you're talking to, right? Yeah. And, and if I'm if I'm on the phone with you and I and I want a job with you, Sergio, you know, from if I look at your perspective, what are the things that matter to you, right? And why what are what's going to incentivize you to help me? And it's not so transactional as it is just common sense, right? And and yeah. so when, you know, if I think about, oh, this is a super busy person, he's giving me, you know, uh, this much amount of his time and, and I just drain him with that time. Uh, like, why would he want to turn around and help me from there? Right. But if I, if I could take that opportunity, which, you know, I already see is, is you giving me something, your time super valuable. Right. And, and I could say, all right, with that opportunity, I'm going to try to demonstrate that I could provide value back to you. Right. And, and I think it's hard because I knew that that was the formula, but it's difficult to figure out what providing back value looks like when you're 18, you know, yeah. and, and, and or when you're 20 or when you're 25, even right. Like what value do I have? And I think the value that you have is you don't have um, the, the responsibilities that, that you may have Sergio. And what I mean by that is, you know, even now I'm 25, I don't have, you know, kids, I don't have a wife. I don't have, you know, a, a mortgage and a house and, 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 you know, friends that have grown up and, and I, I'm really lean right now. Right. right. And so yeah. I, I think that, um, something that, you know, a lot of young kids can benefit from understanding when they think about, you know, what kind of value can they provide back to is just, you got time, you know, and time's, time's valuable. And, and you can, you can do things that take a lot of time that aren't valuable enough for the person that you're, you're talking to, to spend time on, but are valuable. Yep. Right. And so, and I think that's an interesting concept when people struggle to, to, to figure out how they can provide value is just realizing that, that effort and time and, and you just hitting the ground and, and, you know, doing the cold calls and, and picking up the mail and all these little things that aren't valuable, but someone's got to do them. You know, right. those are the things that you can come in and do right off the bat. No question. And I love the word you used earlier in empathy, right? Mm -hmm. Putting yourself in someone else's shoes and understanding that mindset. And again, I think, you know, some of the themes I've heard from you so far is like self-reflection, empathy, right? These are not really things you learn in school, right? Mm, no. These are the things that Gary Vee is talking about, as you mentioned, right? These are the yep. things that a lot of very high level CEOs that understand people and yep. business are talking about. Right. So just everybody listening, just take note of that. Okay. Because if you can understand people and put yourself in other people's shoes, it just create it just opens up a window into how you can win and you can create win-win situations versus woe is me. I want a job. How can you help me? Because the world just doesn't work that way. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. And that was one of the, the best pieces of advice I got early on. Uh, one of the first sports agents I talked to. He recommended, I didn't end up taking his advice, but I took a lot of classes. He recommended I major in psychology, you know, and, and I was taken aback by that. It was not marketing, not pre-law, um, psychology. And, and, and so, and I took a lot of psychology classes. I didn't end up majoring in it, but I think it, that is such an important piece is understanding people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you work in the business of sports. No question. So you get the job with AJ, right? And you were his assistant. Yep. Talk a little bit about like what your roles and responsibilities were. And because again, you mentioned like you were lean, 
you're yep. up for doing anything, right? Which is absolutely the right attitude to have. Talk a little bit about what that looked like in the early stages. Yeah, I mean, it was really, um, it was an exhilarating job that he, he gave me a, a lot of different responsibilities. So, you know, at the, the, the core of it was his calendar. Um, and at its face value, managing a calendar may seem uh, simple, but managing an executive's calendar is, is a job in and of itself. And so understanding that, you know, a 15 minute meeting should go next to a 15 minute meeting, which should go next to a 30 meeting, 30 minute meeting followed by an hour block um, is, is important. Right. And, yeah. and setting and, and starting to, to architect his calendar in a way that was going to set him up to be the most effective every day and fitting in, um, a lot of different people that wanted to talk to him and then starting to understand prioritizing who he should talk to and starting to, um, you know, for lack of a better term, stiff arm some people and bring some other people close is a skill. Mm -hmm. Right. And so massaging that calendar, um, setting him up for success. Um, that was a huge part of the job early on. And, and that was, um, it was, it started to become really fun. You know, I would, I would kind of look at it as a puzzle and, you know, you put that there, you put that there. He talks to this person, you should talk to this person next, same topic, you know, and, and really just setting him up to, to go through his week and be the most successful and, and effective and, and scale him as much as possible. Right. And I think, again, going back to that empathy piece, right? Really being able, I mean, once you see somebody's calendar, right, you understand what is important to them, right? And then you yep. start to construct that calendar, right? You get, you almost get like insights into where the business is going, what is yep. important. And, but one, one comment you made, and, and I remember my first meeting with AJ, right? He was, he was happy to meet with me, which, which I was fired up about. And it was a 15 minute meeting. Okay. Yep. And generally people I meet with, they give me 30 minutes, they give me an yep. hour. I'm like, dude, that's smart. Right. Like yeah. let's like prepare with 15 minutes. Okay. Yep. The other person on the other side, if they have something to say, they're preparing for that meeting and they're going to yep. make it short. They're going to make it concise and you're going to get to the point. Right. No doubt. And so that's no one of the things that I've been working on in my life. Right. When people want my time, especially when I'm trying to help younger people or they want to yep. be mentored, whatever it might be, you got 15 minutes. Right. And yep. it's not because I'm being a jerk. Okay. No. But at the end of the day, right. There's only so much time in the day. Right. No doubt. And I'm giving you my time. So you've got 15 minutes, think long and hard about what it is you want to say. And I'm more than happy to answer your questions to the best of my ability. But that was one thing that even just from afar, I've learned from AJ. No doubt. And I mean, I think, you know, when you think about a typical conversation, most of them could be done in, in five minutes or less. Right. right. And so right. when you start to schedule your calendar like that, it eliminates a lot of the small talk and some of just the the filler time that people fill up a 30 minute meeting with. And like you said, it's not to be a jerk. It's, I mean, he would love to talk to everyone, but you know, you, you just, you free yourself up to talk to more people. And when, when he's dealing with the volume that he is just the reality of the situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And again, just going back to just general planning and self-reflection, right. If, if, you know, it's, it's coming to the realization that there's only so much time in the day, right? Yep. And you want to be as effective as possible. Therefore, this is the amount of time I'm going to allocate to many these different things so that I have time for all the things that are important to me in my life, right? No doubt. And so yeah. that's something that think, I've definitely learned. Yeah. And I think a, a great piece of insight that you said earlier is, is um, you start to see the priorities of the business, right? right? Looking, yeah. I think so many people are dismissive of, you know, an executive assistant role or, or, or someone who manages a calendar, looking at uh, the CEO or really any executive or, you know, any important person's calendar, it tells you so much about the things they care about. And you really do get to see where the, where the ball is headed, right. To, right. to use a, a basketball term where the ball is bouncing. Right. And so um, I, I thought that was extremely valuable, you know, between that and, and, you know, some of the, some of the note taking that I would do and some of the calls that I would jump on and just be a fly on the wall for, you know, all of that stuff at face value. I think a lot of people, especially when you're younger, you know, have too much pride to, to sit on a call and take notes or have too much pride to put together a calendar, man, that is really the, that's the secret sauce right there. And you, you really get yeah. to see things, um, that when, you know, if you eventually, you know, get promoted and, and, and move on to another role, that stuff is so important and so foundational to, to, you know, the rest of your career, really. 
Yeah. I mean, look, it, it's funny you mentioned that some people say that they're above being an assistant because, yeah. you know, I mean, you obviously got uh, an assistant job with a very high level person who has his priorities straight, who is, you know, building something awesome, which we'll get into. But yeah. for all of you listening out there, like being somebody's assistant, again, like I said, like when I was at SC, right, you, you look around and you're like, man, this this guy operates at a different level. Right. Yep. Like this, this person is motivated possibly at a different level than I am. Right. And understanding how he thinks, how he spends his time. That's, that's the secret sauce. That's absolute gold. So yeah. And, and you- understanding the, not to cut you off, but and understanding the gravity of that responsibility, right? This, right. this executive, right. Who, who is this important has, has given you know, basically from the moment he wakes up to the moment he goes to bed, you're telling him what to do. You're telling me to talk to this person, that person, go here, do this. Right. Think about the, the level of trust and, and the weight of that job. You know, I think Seth lost on some people, you know, that's a huge responsibility, you know, and that's a huge vote of confidence by them. No question. No question. Yeah, man, that's, that's, that's fantastic stuff. So yeah. uh, how long did you do that job for? So I was an assistant for about eight or nine months. Um, okay. and, and, and I, it felt like two years, you know, I, I just, I learned a ton. I absorbed a ton. Um, some of the other things that I got to do was a little more, you know, client relations, client services, because I had a background in, in football and played college football. And we were just getting into the world of NIL at the time. You know, I got to, to help AJ with some of those relationships and, and it got to develop some relationships with some of the players, um, and so, you know, I got to do a really a, a whole host of things. I got to sit on, you know, some of their venture capital calls and learn that world. And, and so really got a, a wide breadth and depth of experience. Um, and, and he was um, generous enough to let me in on a lot of different things that probably fell technically outside of my job description. Right. But, you know, I had an appetite to, to do as much as he was willing. You know, we talked about it. I felt lean. I felt like I had 24 hours every day to, to fill up and, you know, put a little sleep in there. And, and so, um, he, he really let me touch a lot of things. And, and so, yeah, I did that for about eight or nine months. And then we, um, we were working on an NFT project for the last three to four. Um, and, and that was called the Vayner sports pass that mm-hmm. launched. And, and, uh, I believe it was March or April of this year. Um, and when that launched, um, that was the opportunity for me to, to kind of carry on and, and, and move up and, and get promoted. Right person, right time, right? No you doubt. had already demonstrated that you were, uh, you were trustworthy, you were hardworking, you were willing to do whatever. Something yeah. new starts up. You're the right guy. And yeah, uh, I think I, it's, it's that, you know, I like the basketball terminology. I know you're a basketball guy, Sergio. It's called hanging around the hoop, right? That's right. Just, just That's hang right. around the hoop and, and the ball's going to bounce. And, and, you know, I think just, just being in the right place is, is such a product of patience, really. You know, yeah. like you, you can't be in the right place if you just show up and you look around, you got to sit there and, and kind of stay there for a while. And I think that's a, another lesson that I think is really important for, for young people to understand in this industry is you really got to sit and, and kind of hang around the hoop. No question. I love that analogy. Hang yeah. around the hoop. And, you know, for me, it was, you know, I never had a jump shot, right. I was awful on offense, but I would grab rebounds. Right. Yeah. And that's just going back to what I, you know, what my place was on whatever team was. I knew that, uh, you know, I could outwork people and, uh, and grab boards. So love that. Talk about the NFT sports pass. What it, what is it you guys are doing over there? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're really the first, uh, sports agency to come up with this concept and, and, you know, it's, it's basically, uh, the best way to look at it is a a membership club, right? Okay. And so, so we released a project of 15,555, uh, NFTs, digital tokens, that granted um, our holder base, um, uh, our, our pass holders, unique access to our network of athletes and unique access to the experiences that we could put on with those athletes. And okay. so, um, and, and that's physical and digital, right? So, so we've also done, you know, virtual conversations with athletes where, you know, you hear the kinds of things that you won't hear on ESPN, you won't hear on you know the radio row that they go down and you get to really hear the real true story of these athletes. And so I think that, you know, the goal for this pass is uh, allowing the, the, the sports fan uh, a new level of access to, mm-hmm. you know, to, to athletes really, 
And, and that's the kind of thing that the blockchain has enabled people to do. Um, and so, you know, we went early on that. Um, it's been, it's been a really uh, interesting route, you know, and, and one of those things, when you're building something, there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of learnings that go on, but, um, but it's been a success so far. Yeah. And I know that through our conversations, you've had the opportunity to go to a lot of different cool events and, you know, interact with a lot of cool people, whether it be executives and athletes and whatever it might be. What, what does your general day-to-day look like as somebody who's that heavily involved in something like that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, it's a little bit of, of both, right? So it's, it's working on, you know, the customer experience and, and what okay. that looks like for them. And then it's working on the other side with the athlete and, and how that experience looks for them. And so um, to get a little more concrete with it, we did it, uh, an experience in Toronto um, uh, at the Blue Jays, right? And, and we have the, the starting catcher for the Blue Jays, Alejandro Kirk is a client of Vayner Sports, right? And so I had to work with Alejandro on, on what is an experience with pass holders that, um, that they'll get excited about that you are excited about too, right? Because mm-hmm. Alejandro is a client of Vayner Sports. So, so first kind of reverse engineering it, Alejandro, what's something you'd be interested in doing? And we came up with, well, you know, batting practice is something I could get them that they can't buy on, you know, StubHub or anything like that. That's an easy thing for me to do, right? Uh, you know, I'm happy to sign some balls. I'm happy to come on have a discussion with the Vayner Sports Pass community on, on a digital, you know, um, version. I'm happy to take pictures with people before the game. And so, you know, all those things are, are they take coordination. They take, a, you know, again, to use that, come back to that word empathy. They take, you know, me understanding Alejandro and the things that he wants to do and doesn't want to do before, a, you know, a big game. And then right. it's, going, it's going back to to the other side, to the pass holders, to, to these people who have, have purchased the pass and have a level of expectation of what's going to come with it. And it's communicating with them and, and helping them have the best experience possible. So, you know, it's really a, a dynamic role and, and you got to be, um, you got to understand people. And just going back to my question, like what, what, like, tell us about your day, right? Day I to, mean, obviously, yeah. obvi- obviously, you know, your job doesn't entail doing the same things every right. single day, right? But can you yeah, give I the mean, listeners like a little bit, a little bit of insight? Like yeah. what time do you start your day? What does your day look like? You know, what do yep. the progressions look like? Yep. So um, it's it's a difficult question because there is so much uh, fluctuation between what every day looks like for me. But just to start with today, I was up at 6 a.m. I did a yoga class at 7. I got in the office around 8.15. Um, you know, I knew AJ was going to be coming in today. He had, a you know, a, an important meeting. Um, I wanted to make sure he was ready for that with the, with the person he's meeting with, right? So I, I couldn't talk about that, but... Um, I could talk about, you know, the, the types of information that he needed prior to that meeting. Right. And so putting that together, making it very concise, you know, cause he's, he's really rolling into the meeting. What do I need to know? Okay. And then he goes, um, okay. getting that, getting that ready for him. Um, I'll have another conversation with one of our agents on the baseball side later today about, um, the things that we need to do for, you know, a top client, right. Uh, he just, he just came off a very, uh, a very hot, um, run right in the playoffs. And so I have a conversation about the things that are important for us as an agency to deliver for him. Um, mm-hmm. and then I'll probably have a couple conversations with a couple clients on the NIL front, right. And just help them understand that, you know, AJ is, 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 uh, he's paying attention to them. Even if he can't talk to them today, you know, I'm going to talk to him tomorrow and we're going to talk today. And so, uh, it's a lot of scaling AJ. It's a lot of conversations with people that, you know, need information to get to AJ, but he doesn't have the time to talk to them. Um, not that they're not important, right? But right. just a, a product of circumstance. And so um, there's a lot of information funneling. I, I think that's mm-hmm. probably the best way to put it. Um, yeah. There's a lot of information coming into me that I take, I digest. Um, I try to have nuanced, complex conversations where I, you know, manage expectations and also demonstrate, um, you know, a certain level of understanding of their needs. And then I try to come back to AJ and, you know, centralize that information, distill that information um, and, and create a plan to, to attack that problem. And so I don't know if that's the best possible day to day. It's, it's, there's a lot of things that are really um, fluid, you know, every yeah. week that the priorities of, of what we're working on change. But I think, you know, that's kind of the high level of, of what the, what the days look like. 
Yeah. I mean, you mentioned scaling AJ. I love that term, right? Yeah. Uh, and just, you know, and, and, and I love the insights into how you do that, right? You know what it is, or you have a good sense based on your relationship about what it is he needs to know at yep. what point he needs to actually receive the information, right? Yep. And you're giving it to him in a form that's digestible. And again, yep. you're, you're just, you're giving, you're, you're providing value. Right. And what what I love about what you and I's conversations have been to date is that, you know, you're just you're 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 getting so much information right now. Yeah. Right. Based on everything you're doing with your clients, everything you're doing with the NFTs, all the people that you interact with. Right. And so you're just you are amassing information, getting smarter and really starting to figure out what it is that everybody around you needs to know in order so that, you know, the whole organization can rise. I think that yeah. uh, it's, a, yeah, no, it's, that's, it's an amazing thing. It's a really good summary. And I think, you know, the key piece is understanding um, that distill that distillation process of information. You have yeah. to understand what are the important things, right? So, so you can have a conversation with someone and, and all of it's 15 minutes, if it's 30 minutes, not to say that all of that 15 or 30 minutes isn't important, right? But there's going to be one to two to maybe three pieces of information that come out of that meeting, right? That are really important to take back to whoever you're distilling it down to, right? And I think that kind of recognition um, and prioritization of information, I think that's a huge piece for, you know, for people to have a job like me where I'm trying to scale, you know, a, an executive. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's, let's talk about AJ for just a little bit here. When I, yeah. when we did the call, when I did my, my last video call with him, he's wearing a shirt that said motivated. Right. Mm. And I absolutely mm -hmm. love that. Is there anything else that you've learned from AJ or, you know, any of the key people around you that uh, you'd like to share? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing about AJ that's um, impressed slash surprised me is, is really that piece, right. That, that chip on his shoulder, that prove it mentality, you know, this is a guy that has had um, a ton of success um, in his career. Uh, he's only, you know, 35 years old and he's, you know, uh, co-founded a company that's now, a, you know, a, the largest digital independent, you know, advertising agency he took it from, you know, uh, you know, 12 employees to 800 as the, the COO and the CFO at times. Um, you know, he's had incredible venture success you know, Uber and Venmo early investor. And so this is a kind of, this is a guy that really could, if he wanted to kind of kick up his feet and, and, and write down his list of accomplishments and, and sit back and say, I've done right. it. Right. And, and yeah. that's not at all his MO. That's not the energy that he walks into the room with. It, it is that, um, that chip on his shoulder um, that, you know, there's more to prove. And I think that kind of that energy permeates throughout the organization. You know, when you're around him, you feel like, there's unfinished business. And, and even uh, in his next act, you know, Vayner Sports is only five years old. You know, we have over a hundred clients at this point, you know, and, and we've had a lot of success to date, but I think everyone in our organization feels like there's a lot left to prove, you know, and I think that starts at the top. And I think um, that's the piece that's really stuck with me is, you know, in, in a world where this guy doesn't have really anything to prove, <laughs> He feels right. like he does, you know, he feels right. like he does. And he, he approaches every day like that. Yeah. And that's I've, uh, another word I've heard you use various different times throughout many conversations is just energy, right? I've got the energy to do this. We have the energy to do that. Yep. Is that, you know, speak, speak to that a little bit, right? Cause that's, I mean, it seems to me and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's probably a term you guys use around the office and with each yep. other, right? Is there energy for this? This may be a good idea, but right. You know, I don't know yeah. if we have the energy for that. Speak to that a yeah. little bit. I think I think that comes from a concept which I really believe in, and I, I think it's it does um, exist in our up and down in our organization. That you know, we only have so many hours in the day. You know, and, and beyond that, we only have um, so much energy. Right, every mm -hmm. day you wake up, you go to sleep, you you recharge. Right, and so yeah. there's things that are energy uh, drainers, right, and there's things that are energy givers, right, and I think. Um, when you think about whether or not you have energy for something, um, is this something that excites you, right? Is this something that if you attack and you decide to do that, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get energy from, you're going to be energized by that task, or is mm -hmm. it something that's going to drain you, right? And I think the more that you choose the activities that excite you and are going to energize you, um, 
the really just you're going to be full of more energy, right? Like it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. not, it's not a crazy concept. It's not rocket science. Right. And so no. that is something I think we think about, and it, you know, it doesn't mean that I never do something that's going to take some of my energy. Right. Cause sometimes that you just have to, you gotta, you gotta get up and put on your hard hat and, and do something that you're not thrilled to do. But um, I think if you can minimize those scenarios and you could do the stuff that you are excited about. And when you're making high level decisions about whether or not we're going to, you know, introduce this new business opportunity. Um, it is a choice, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you don't have to say yes to everything that comes across your desk. And there might be something that makes business sense, but it's going to take so much of your energy that the other four things that also make business sense are not going to get done, right? And so I think that's something that we are conscious about. And um, you know, I think it's important. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And I think it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? A little bit of self-reflection about where you're at, who you are, and what you want to commit time to, which yeah. is a which is a good segue. Um, do you do you have any like daily? We all have daily habits, right? But yeah. do you have any like intentional daily habits that you go yeah. through, like in order to you know yeah. just maximize your day? Yeah, I think uh, it's something I wish was a daily habit, but it's probably more of a four four days a week habit. But something that's been really important for me and is on theme with everything we talked about is, excuse me, is a, is a meditation practice. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's something, if I could sit for 10 minutes a day, if I could sit for 20 minutes a day, um, it really uh, allows me to get very still. Um, it allows me to, um, kind of train my mind. You know, I think a lot of people think about meditation is close your eyes and have no thoughts come through your head. Um, I look at it a little bit more as going to the mental gym, you know, and yeah. so that that's something that I've really worked on and I've done it for the last two years and it's made a, a massive difference in my focus and my clarity. Um, and I think it is just an opportunity to kind of sit down, be with yourself and notice thoughts, right? And, and you don't, no one ever, unless you're some enlightened Buddhist, no one ever sits <laughs> down for 10 or 20 minutes. It doesn't have a single thought, right? And so the concept right. is not to get too deep into it, but the concept is to just to notice those thoughts and, and to bring awareness to the thoughts. And so that's a, that's a practice that I would say has been a huge part of my, uh, daily or, or, you know, semi daily routine. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, beyond that, you know, getting to the gym, you know, doing, doing physical movement, I think is a huge piece. I'm a, I'm a former athlete. I think that, you know, that that's another kind of type of meditation in a, in a way. And, and brings a lot of, um, feelings of, you know, being refreshed and, and being rejuvenated. And so I think, uh, those are probably, you know, the two things is, is the physical gym and the mental gym. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, how does that, uh, do you use an app for meditation yeah. or, you know, yeah. tell us about how so, that, what that looks like. Yeah, I got introduced. Um, you know, obviously Headspace is, is a hugely popular app. I, I use mm -hmm. a different one. It's called waking up with Sam Harris. Um, I'm a waking really, up guy myself. So. Nice, nice. Yeah. yeah. So he, I, I think he does a really great job of kind of teaching the fundamentals of the practice. And mm -hmm. it's a little bit, I think, more um, disciplined version of a meditation app. You know, I think it's a little less mass appeal. Um, and it, it, got, it really goes deep into the concepts of meditation and mindfulness. Yeah. It's how, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? Right. Yep. Yep. No, I think that's the real deal, personally. What about uh, self-reflection, right? Is there yeah. like a, a structured way that that takes place for you? Yeah, I mean, I think a concept which I'm um, I'm currently working on reintroducing. I've, I've kind of fallen off the beat to be transparent, um, but something that's helped me a lot in the past and, and um, I think is important for everyone is, is journaling. Um, you know, when you just sit down and you could write, you know, things that are on your mind, whether it's goals or fears or um, things that are troubling you at the moment, like you could see it on paper. And sometimes that goal that looks so big and unattainable actually looks, you know, pretty realistic. Sometimes that fear that, you know, is, is really giving you a hard time actually, actually looks like something you really shouldn't worry about. And, and I right. think the other thing that's cool is when you do it consistently, and I have done it consistently in the past, you kind of get to look back, right. And you get to, to really put all these on paper and then flip through the pages and, and see, Oh, wait, I was just really kind of going down a, a little hole here and then I picked it back up or 
man, I got really way too high on myself and I thought I was the man here. And, you know, some, some themes emerge, right. And you start to yeah. kind of be able to, to kind of level set yourself a little bit and it's easier to recognize, um, you know, when, when you're going through those moments. No question. No question. A good product for those of you out there who don't have a journaling pra- uh, practice is the five minute journal. I don't know if you're familiar, but, uh, Good product, five minutes, you know, gets you in, in, in the right space as far as... Is that, a, is, that a, um, is that a Tim Ferriss tool? It is a Tim Ferriss tool. It yep. is a Tim Ferriss he, tool. He's a, he's a five-hour guy, so five, five hour, a, five minute. Yeah, Everything's five, right? Everything's yeah, got to yeah. have a five in it. So, yep. Yep. so other than Good Night Moon, which I, uh, <laughs> I know you're a big fan of, uh, yeah. are there any other books that have like really influenced you? Yeah. Um, what's the, what's the cursing policy on this show, Sergio? I know we there, have a little you bit fire of a young... away. You fire okay, away. So, uh, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Um, yep. that was a book that honestly, when I think about books that had an impact on me, that's probably number one. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I told my mom, I was reading it, she wasn't too pleased, <laughs> you know, uh, you're reading what, <laughs> you know? Um, but the, you know, counterintuitive to the title of the book, I found that it's not really about not giving a fuck. It's about, it's about giving a fuck about the right things. Right. And not giving a fuck about all the, all the things that don't really matter that are, that are surface level, that are superficial. Um, and, and, and it's a priorities book, right? It's about figuring out what matters to you and everything that falls out of that. Um, everything that falls outside of that, it, it's got to get washed away, you know? And I think, um, another concept that kind of came from that is this idea of the spam folder. Right. Mm-hmm. And this was something that um, I'll give credit to my coach at Yale, Coach Reno. You know, he had a conversation with me and he said, every day, Garrett, I have a folder and it's called noise. Right. And I, and I get emails every day that I just go directly to the noise, field, to the noise folder. Right. And I thought that was a fascinating concept. You know, you're talking about a guy who's, who's leading a historic program that's in charge of you know, a bunch of young men and has a bunch of alumni that really care about the, you know, the outcomes of the game and are giving them all kinds of feedback on, you know, things that he should do or things he's not doing well. And he has a folder where he says, that's just noise. Right. And I think that that's, you know, it, it, it transcends an email inbox in my opinion. You know, I think there's a lot of information and a lot of chatter and social media that is really just noise. And I think that that book kind of got at that concept as well as, you can't pay attention to the things that are noise. You have to really pay attention to the things that are going to be, you know, important in in you attacking the goals and the outcomes that you want. No question. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, Garrett, this has been phenomenal. I've already taken up uh, way too many of your 15 minute chunks here. I appreciate you taking the time. And I just, I just want to acknowledge you for, you know, everything you've done thus far. Like I said, when we first started talking, you know, you're obviously a rock star. You're a superstar in this business already. And this has been great. I mean, for everybody no, listening, I, Garrett's, yeah, I really Garrett's appreciate said, it. There's, there's been so many gems in this episode. Uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge you because this is, you know, hopefully going to change some people's lives. Thanks. No, I, it really means a lot. And I, I want to give credit to you for, for giving me so much of your time and, and for, you know, for, for feeling like I'm someone that's important enough to, you know, to talk to and take an interest in and, and having the humility to just consistently engage me and, and really be willing and open to work with me. And, and I'm, I'm, like I said, at the start of the show, I'm, I'm humbled to be asked to be on here. Um, and I had a blast. I really did. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for your time and, uh, you know, look forward to a lifelong friendship here. Sounds good, brother. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. See ya. There you have it, my friends. I hope you enjoy this conversation with the one and only Garrett White. You can find the show notes for everything we discussed at sportsbusinessclassroom.com slash Garrett-White-Vaynersports. If you listen and enjoy the podcast, we'd really love to hear from you. Let us know your thoughts and any follow-up questions you may have by tagging us at Sports Business Classroom on Instagram and at Sports Biz Class on Twitter. Big thank you to our sponsors, Sports Business Classroom On Demand and Hall Pass Media. And thanks again for listening. We will see you here next week on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. Mm-hmm.